Okay, so my talk is really, in many respects, about the idea of hype in the context of science. And I feel very passionately about this topic. In fact, I think it is emerging as one of the biggest issues in the context of knowledge creation uh, in, in the developed world. There's hype everywhere. I think everyone in this room probably knows that. Uh, and when people think of hype, they often think about uh, media representations of it. So we have lots of hype in the context of neuroscience. There's growing concern, and this is something I've been following for, um, for years, and there is growing concern. You're starting to see popular culture recognize this phenomenon, right? The idea that research is often not reported in an ideal manner, uh, that there is bias, and that there is a lot of hype. When people think about hype in science, I think the intuitive response is that we're thinking about overemphasizing benefits. But in fact, and this was a piece I did with some uh, colleagues um, at Duke and at McGill, uh, there's also hype in the context of representations of harm, career pressure, publication pressure, institutional pressure, funding pressure for sure, patient expectations, public expectations, commercialization, we already saw that word, media spin, of course, and marketing. Now, one of the reasons I'm interested in this is because so much of the public debate so much of the face of science is at the end of the pipeline. The more striking the result, the stronger the effect size, and the better the journal, the more likely it's wrong. The reporters need to sell their story. They've got to sell their story not only to the public, they've got to sell it to their editors. So you have hype happening there, and that leads to all these kind of crazy headlines, like is there a scientific explanation for Justin Bieber? The other force, the other pressure, and one that we're very interested in, and I'll go through this very quickly, is commercialization pressure. The commercialization pressure is increasing. It's intensifying throughout the country. Uh, it's part of the CIHR mandate. There's a huge pressure in the United States. It's, uh, I love using this example. This was Barack Obama's 2011 State of the Union address where he said it was their country's Sputnik moment. And in, in, uh, by calling it the Sputnik moment, he wasn't talking about the Cold War. He wasn't talking about, about Russia. He was talking about competing with China economically. And he wanted to do that through research and innovation. And so he said, basically, that we're going to invest in biomedical research to create jobs, right, to stimulate the economy. Now, that is a lot of translation pressure, right? That's significant translation pressure, which may nudge people to hype their research, to make it sound like their research is closer to being commercializable, closer to being translationable. Uh, and then, of course, because of that, you have the other layer of the hype and bias that comes with working with industry. Completely necessary. I'm not saying that that is inappropriate, but research tells us, right, that if you work with industry, your work is more likely to have a bias towards a positive outcome. One could argue, and we do in the conclusion, there's no place within the Canadian research funding environment that is not touched by this commercialization pressure. More importantly, there is no explicit mention of any cost or harms. Commercialization pressure might be a good idea, but at a minimum, it should be balanced against the harms uh, that may be associated with that pressure. So, of course, there's also career pressure. Lots of interesting research says that the desire to get published leads to exaggerated claims. And uh, in addition to that, there are a number of very interesting underplayed sources of hype that I'd like to highlight quickly. The first is the white hat bias. And this is the idea that if a topic of research is viewed as a noble cause or in support of a noble cause, it's more likely to get published, and the results are more likely to be exaggerated. So you can see how that could play out in a lot of domains, right? Uh, another one, of course, is very powerful funding groups, uh, or disease groups, for example. They can have a big impact on how various areas of biomedical research are represented, and new media has a tremendous impact. Uh, the other source of hype that seems frivolous uh, but is actually tremendously powerful, is the celebrity universe. Celebrities have a huge impact on how people perceive research in biomedical worlds. Now, this seems funny and stupid, but man, does it have an impact. Uh, here is Katy Perry. Here she is holding up her vitamin, saying she's living a vitamin life. Um, people say, well, that's, you know, who cares, Tim? How many followers does she have? 51 million. 51 million people listen to her theories on vitamins. So what are the ramifications? People say, Tim, maybe you're right. There's all this hype. Who the heck cares? Well, let's just look at some of the possible bad ramifications here. The premature implementation of, of technologies, such as stem cells. The inappropriate exploitation by the market. Um, poor research funding 
uh, decisions, and I think this is a big problem. You get this sort of momentum that builds up around a, a, a particular area. Evidence that there's increased research inefficiencies, and I think this is very important. Now, I believe science wins out. I think eventually scientific inquiry comes to the right answer, but hype makes the scientific process less efficient. Uh, there's uh, leads to poorly informed social policy and poorly uh, informed and confused public. And there's lots of uh, evidence of that. And you may lose public trust in this context if you don't kind of reel in the hype. And there are hints this is starting to happen. So here are just a couple examples from pop culture where you see the, the um, commentary about, you know, where are these miracles? Where are, where are the great advances that you promise when you ask for all this money? Where are all the miracle drugs? Uh, what happened to the radical breakthroughs, you get the idea. So there are hints that this kind of backlash, I do think that it can have, it can have a very adverse impact on how we, not just as a broad community, but even as an academic community, talk and think about these issues. So this is my hype machine. You have a science area emerge. There's lots of speculation about it, and speculation about particular social concerns. Those social concerns and hype sort of crystallize in the beliefs of the benefits, but also in the harms. And then the policy response, be it, be it legislation, uh, research ethics, respond to that sort of simplified in, uh, view of the issues. They don't really respond to reality. And uh, I think that hype plays, this, what we've been talking about today, plays a huge role in the context of framing these discussions. Um, think about the mind reading is happening in neuroscience. And I think, and I'm curious if my colleagues in the room agree with this, I think a lot of the debate around things like genetic discrimination are also a result of, of the hype around a particular science. I think we need to think of novel approaches to publication, media training, de-emphasizing um, things like impact factor. I think we need to nurture skepticism in our public. I think we need to nurture skepticism in our elementary schools and teach about the scientific method. Um, I think we need to fund robustly independent, independent sources of, of knowledge. I'm a big fan of things like the Cochrane Collaboration. And perhaps more, most importantly, we need to face uh, the impact of our, of our aggressive translation ethos that we have right now, because I do think that is resulting in a great deal of hype. Thanks very much, and these are all the entities that I hype my work for. Thank you.